Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following his work for years. It's a really unique perspective for our listeners who are not familiar. He's Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocco Report. Let me just read his bio really quick. He's an independent researcher. Uh, he started to invest in precious metals in 2002. In 2008, he began researching areas of the gold and silver market that, curiously, the majority of precious metal analyst community have less unexplored. These areas include how energy and the following energy return on energy invested stand to impact the mining industry, precious metals, paper assets, and the overall economy. He has a lot of interesting insights into the mining sector that I, I think our listeners, whether you're a hedge fund manager, uh, a stacker, or, or, a, or a mining stock guy who's, who's buying a mix of precious metals and mining stocks, will get a lot out of. Thank you for joining us, Steve. Yeah, hey, Jason. It's great to be here. No, I'm Steve. I, I consider you. I really enjoy your articles. I read almost every one of them for the last number of years. Um, I really enjoy your perspective on the production costs of the gold and silver miners. Um, uh, in in your opinion, uh, has the industry been able to cut costs a lot in the last few years? Well, I think what uh, on the way up, when the prices moved on the way up, they were adding more. Uh, uh, using more capital, uh, uh, opening up more projects, so uh, their their costs increased. But as the price peaked in 2011, and it's been falling ever since, uh, they've been cutting back. Uh, and I've been following this for a couple of years because the reason why I started looking at the, the, this silver mining uh, uh, cost structure for the industry, uh, because the two official sources, uh, GFMS and CPM Group, were using cash costs. And, and so I think last year the uh, CPM group said uh, it fell to below $10. So according to the typical unorthodox retail investor or maybe some more uh, sophisticated investors, they think that the, 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 the uh, break even or the margin is $10. So if the price of silver is 20, then there's a 50, there's a double margin there. Well, I believe cash costs are not a reliable source of profitability for a company. And uh, actually, I'm looking at two, two examples right here. Heckler said that they had a $4.81 cash cost in 2014. Uh, but what's interesting is how do you get cash cost? You deduct the byproduct credits. They call it credits. Well, 65% of their revenue is byproduct credits and gold. So if you take 65% of your revenue and you deduct it from your cost, of course you're going to have a low cash cost. Now, Tahoe, which is the lowest producer, silver producer out there, uh, their cash cost was higher than Heckler in 2014. It was 626 but their byproduct revenue is only 11%. So they are the premier 89% uh, silver revenue producer. Uh, and the difference was last year, Heckler – their break even, according to my estimates, was like 1887, and Tahoe was 1370. So even though Hecla had a lower cash cost, they made a little bit of money. Where Tahoe made a lot of money. Now, in 2013, uh, I have a top 12. It doesn't include all the, the primary silver mines, but it's a it's a broad spectrum of a, a pretty good representation. In 2013. Uh, the top 12 I had, they uh, they had total revenue of 3.1 billion, and they sold 93 million ounces of silver. Well, in 2014, they sold 116 million ounces of silver, 23 million ounces more, and their their uh, revenue only went up 200 uh, 200 million to 3.3. So. The break-even in 2013 for the group fell from $24, and in 2013, it's down to 19 And that's cutting on expiration. That's cutting on uh, all, signs, all kinds of costs, including energy. And I think we may see a little bit uh, a more of a decline in the first quarter. But uh, I believe, Jason, that uh, I, I, I see a floor for the primary silver miners. Uh, about eighteen dollars. Uh, so right, we're at nineteen right now for the year. We could fall a little further, but I don't think the the primary silver miners, as a group, some are some are lower cost and some are higher cost. But as a group, I don't see it falling below eighteen, even with this current oil price. And if 
with the price of silver now at 16, so they would still be losing money even if their costs continue to fall another dollar. Yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges to the mi- to the mining industry, Steve. Whether it's grades or in your articles, you wrote about how much more diesel is being used over the last 10, 12 years just to pull one more ounce of silver, one more ounce of gold out of the ground. How much more rock has to be used? How um, the mining companies have started to use these massively inefficient, you know, giant caterpillar earth mover trucks. I mean, they're they're forced to use them. They don't they don't have much of a choice if they want to get that gold or get that silver because it's not e- it's not low hanging fruit anymore, they have to get it. But your point about the cash costs and the all-in sustaining costs, I, I think it's something that most of the people I argue with about the gold and silver industry, they they don't get. You know, they look at the cash costs and they say, well, this is this, but then look at the financials of the companies. If their cash costs were really their total cost, right, these companies would still be profitable at these prices, and yet the financials we've seen from the miners – for the last three years or so, they've been really awful. <laughs> they've they've been really awful. I mean, so, some of the miners, um, they've either had to sell enormous amounts of new shares or they've had to take on debt at very bad rates if they can still take on. And now we're starting to see uh, bankruptcies. Yeah, uh, and I, I think we, you know, you and I had an, an email exchange about this and, and Core in uh, 2000. They had 37 million outstanding shares. Just five years later, it ballooned. Up to 550 million. Well, then in 2000, I think it was nine, they did that one to ten reverse split. So they they got down to 55 million. Well, now Core is back up above 103 million. So looking at this data that I am trying to get a better idea of the the cost structure, because as you say, I don't believe cash cost. And you know, the G the generally accepted accounting principles says cash cost. Uh, they're not a gap. They do not provide the profitability of a company. That's why I designed my system to get a better idea. It's not a, it's not perfect, but it gives us a better idea. And let me uh, let me tell you this. Uh, what's interesting too, in 2013, the group's byproduct revenue was only 36 percent. In 2014, their byproduct revenue and gold is now 44 percent. So. Uh, we're seeing, I think the, uh, they added some gold mines. Some of the, uh, I think Silver Standard added a gold mine. And then the base metal prices actually held up better than silver in 2014. And I've got one chart here I, I want to compare. Uh, the Horn Silver Mine, which was in the 1880s in the United States, that was a typical primary silver mine in the, during the day. Well, in a about 20, let's say a 30-year uh, lifespan, they moved 474,000 tons of ore, and they produced 14 million ounces of silver. Well, First Majestic, which I took a comparison, they processed 482,000 tons of ore in one quarter in 2011, and they produced 1.7 million ounces of silver. So one, back in the day, we were producing 30 ounces per ton in the, night, in the 1800s, and now we're producing about four. So it's almost 10 times less to cost a lot more money. And without energy, you see, without energy, and I made this statement in another interview, the top five gold miners are pulling gold now. Their yield is 1.2 grams per ton. In the 1800s, it was uh, 25 to 30. So it takes without energy, gold is nothing. Uh, So energy is probably the most important aspect for the mining industry as well as the overall economy. Yeah, the the grades, the trend for, and you just brought this up, and I've seen this too, but over the last couple decades, and if you go back, the longer you go back for the mines for the grades, the grades have just fallen, you know, 70, 80, 90%, and every couple decades, they fall another 70, 80, 90%, and yet, you know, the mining industry is expected to increase production, but these economic textbooks, Steve, you know, they say that oh, the quality of the commodity is supposed to increase and the cost is supposed to drop, that this is, you know, economics 101, what the economic theory and textbooks say. But yet, you know, in the mining industry, because demand is still growing for, uh, well, globally, maybe it's it's growing for gold or silver. And um, over, over the last 12 years, it grew for copper, although I think, you know, base metals, I think, are drastically going to contract. Demand is uh, going forward, at least for a while, because of central planning in China. But... Um, I just don't see the cost structure of the mining industry 
being able to to fall like the um the economic theory suggests it will. Yeah, and that's tied to we must remember prior to the late 1800s, uh, the extraction uh, of of mineral of, of minerals metals uh, w- was done by human and animal labor. Well, that was taken over by uh, oil. Uh, coal and oil. And so when you have a barrel of oil, you've got thousands of, of, of energy slaves in there for a very inexpensive price. And that was great uh, up up until, you know, the last couple of years, 10 years. But now the problem is we're, we're, we, are, we are in a global plateau of oil production, even though we've brought on shale, which is very high cost oil. And it, the decline rates in shale are very high. And as well as the energy returned on invested, and I mentioned this in, in prior articles and, and interviews, that we were we were bringing to market 100 barrels of oil in the 1930s in the U.S. for the cost of one in energy. Now, back in and Eagle Ford, it's five to one. So there's a lot less profitable barrels that needs to go around and supply this complex supply chain system and society of ours. So it's it's impacting, it's really impacting the mining industry. And that's why I think we're seeing so much share dilution and debt because really we don't know what the, the, the break even or the real cost of mining gold and silver because uh, there's been so much share dilution over the last decade. If I think if we would incorporate that, I think the price of gold would have to be 2500 and the price of silver is somewhere in the 50s. Those are those are interesting points. Yeah, I, I think the miners over the last 10 or 12 years, they have been able to sell a lot of shares and um, you know raise a lot of debt. But from my contacts in Toronto and Vancouver, that appears that this is coming to an end. You know, the last 12 months, have just been extremely rough for most of the miners to raise capital. Unless unless you're a producer and you're kind of treading water in this environment, maybe you're eking out a profit or you're, you're break even on most of your mines, or maybe your losses are tiny, you're able to raise a decent amount of capital, either debt or equity at a penalty rate. I know I, I talked about that with Keith Newmeyer uh, in my interview uh, last week that I just posted. And he said the investment banks are calling him up you know, every day trying to get him to take on debt. And he won't do it, but he did raise some equity, I think at six dollars fifty cents a share, about thirty million, so he could go do an acquisition. But I, I think the smaller miners, Steve, I, I don't think they're able to raise any capital in this environment anymore. I, I think those days where they could sell as many shares as they wanted, maybe the larger guys can get away with it for a little while, but um I don't think the smaller guys can. I, I think we're gonna see either, you know, the juniors either go bankrupt or evaporate, or they're gonna be forced to sell out to the larger guys soon for uh, pennies on the dollar at fire sale prices. Well, uh, Jason, I totally agree with you. And uh, I've said in, in previous articles that uh, I would not uh, – the junior exploration, especially exploration sector, is in severe trouble. And the reason why they're in severe trouble is not only because of the financial, uh, the financial and economic situation in the United States and the world is, is, is really in, in dire straits. Uh, Peak oil uh, will really will really impact the system going forward. So I I don't see a lot of juniors ever becoming mines just because of the peak oil situation. So if if you are a pretty good mine, you've got good reserves, good reserves, there's a good chance that those are going to be exploited. Um, and here's the good news. I agree with you. I think base metal mining will peak soon after we see the peak of unconventional global oil production. Conventional peaked in 2005. We can't debate that. That's a done deal. What hasn't peaked is that high expensive uh, shale oil, unconventional tar sands, and some of it is deep water. So once that peaks and we start declining, uh, I think we'll we'll see a, a global GDP decline, and then there'll be less demand for base metals. And it could kind of happen like in a cliff. It might be, we may see huge downturns, and then it'll stop, and then it'll be another downturn. But the, the good news is that I think once we have a reset in the system, uh, the primary gold and silver miners, the strong ones, I think will do relatively well because uh, that that will be the go-to assets when other assets, paper and physical, are losing value in a peak oil environment. So 
even though that there, I agree with you that the junior sector is probably not a wise place to be, but the the good profitable uh, gold and silver producers that have good reserves, I think they will do great in the future. Yeah, I think what most of Wall Street doesn't understand is how hard it is to actually pull metal out of the ground. I think they just think, uh, and a lot of stackers think this too, that the metal just kind of magically appears. It's fairly easy to mine. It, it's a very difficult process, you know, with the metallurgy and stuff. And in order to make a profit, I mean, you're using so much chemicals, so much, uh, so much energy just to pull the metal out of the ground. It's a lot of hard work in order to just produce one ounce of gold or one ounce of silver. And, um, you know, I've studied the mining industry, and you mentioned cash costs, but um, I, I look at, you know, selling general and administrative expenses. A lot of miners have been forced to cut that. Rick Rule says that they can cut the SG&A more, but I, I think the miners, most of them have cut pretty much all the other expenses at their actual mine that they can cut. You know, they've high-graded mines. They've changed the mining plan for some of these mines that they weren't supposed to, which long-term it's going to have really bad ramifications for the uh, economics of the mine. But um, I was wondering if you think there's any more actual costs for the miners to be uh, that they can cut without starting to shut down mines and put them on care and maintenance. Well, I agree with you. They they can continue, and and the oil, the fall in the price of oil in half since uh, last year, since the uh, 2014. That that it takes time, but that will finally make its way into the system into the mining. We will see that probably more for the gold miners and silver miners this quarter. Uh, now, if the price of, of oil recovers here towards the end of the year, well, we may still see a little bit lower in the second quarter, but at some point in time, the, the price will start making it, the higher price of oil will start making its way back into the cost. But even, even with that, even if they could uh, cut their costs, as I said, the group could get down to 18, maybe 17 and a half. Uh, and some mines are going to continue uh, um, uh, upgrading. Uh, they're going to add more uh, production, more. Uh, they're going to uh, upgrade to more ore, uh, milling more ore. So that that helps to to lower the cost, but. I don't see them getting the, the overall cost down much uh, from here. And, again, the price of silver is at $16. So uh, even with that, it's still going to be a struggle for them. So I, I do not see uh, much much more reduction in costs going forward. Uh, uh, but the upside of it is uh, I, I think uh, we, we will see a turnaround with the precious metals probably sometime at the end of this year or beginning of next year. Yeah, I, I agree. We look at the fundamentals of the gold and silver market, and we see very strong demand for physical metal using Coos Jansen and Bullion Stars numbers uh, out of China and India and Asia, Middle East. Um, so we see strong demand there for the actual physical part of market, not the paper market. And then, you know, we see potential supp supply problems here. The uh, copper miners, uh, Steve, you know, we were talking about that. But a lot of these copper miners, they brought on very marginal copper deposits when the copper price was much higher, and they hedged their copper production at a profit three, four years ago at much higher copper prices. And a lot of gold and silver production is as a byproduct, as you noted. I think um, I think 70% of annual global silver production is as a byproduct. But um, I, I think these copper mines, you know, once they're, these hedges from the copper miners come off, these copper miners could potentially go bankrupt, and there could be a supply shock um, – in the silver market and maybe even in the gold market as these uh, marginal copper deposits that were higher cost, the hedges come off and the copper miners go bankrupt. Yeah, I call that the great silver byproduct pinch that's coming. And uh, a good example, uh, and according to GFMS, uh, 30, uh, 20% of, of that 70% of byproduct silver production comes from copper. 13 is lead. Uh, I'm sorry, 13 is gold and 38% is comes from lead and zinc. So 20% of the silver production in the world comes from copper. And one of the largest copper uh, byproduct producers for silver is KG HM Poleska in Poland. And uh, I mentioned that they had a pretty good hedge book in 2012 because silver was still $30 an ounce. Uh, now they don't have any uh, hedge book at all for silver. And they're their revenue and profits are continuing to fall. 
and uh, Jason, they, they produced 40 million ounces of, of silver normally, 39, 40 million ounces a year. That, that's, a, that's more than, that's actually more than the top primary silver miners. So I do see if the price of copper continues to fall, I do see a, a pinch on the base metal mining industry. And I, I think we're going to see less silver production uh, coming from the base metal mining industry. And probably in the future, we'll see more primary silver miners coming online because it, the energy cost is less and the energy consumption per ounce of silver produced is less because you have to move a lot of ore to produce copper. I mean, gold and, and uh, iron ore and all those, but especially copper. And you, you need a lot more uh, diesel and energy to, to, to process the silver that comes as a byproduct from mining copper. And um, you, you already said earlier in the interview, uh, this question is from Eric Dubin, though, my friend over at uh, Silver Doctors and News Doctors. Uh, have miners survived past periods of years where metals prices are way below production costs based on your research? Yeah, I, we touched on this earlier. Um, I've, I've got some annual reports for Coeur d'Alene going back to 1993, and, geez, I looked, I looked at uh, their – their annual statements, and I think from 1998 to 2005, they they sh they showed losses, net income losses every year. I mean, the price of silver was like five bucks back, four fifty, five dollars, and even though the price of oil uh, was in the twenty dollar range uh, back during that time. Core was not making any money. They were they were losing money, and so that's the reason why we saw that huge ramp up in their uh, their shares, their outstanding shares. I mean, it was almost it was like 20 times their they increased their shares. So uh, miners have and continue to to fortify their balance sheet with uh, either share dilution or cutting costs. And, and or expanding uh, production by uh, share dilution. Well, like we've talked about, I don't think they're, they're, they will be able to continue doing this in the future. So it's going to be the leanest companies. And, uh, you know, Core has a very, um, they have one of the highest break even. Let me take a quick look at my chart here. Their break even for 2014, believe it or not, was $22. So uh, they have a lot of expensive mines, and uh, uh, I don't I don't believe um, that the mining industry can continue uh, with shared dilution to ba to fortify their balance sheet. So we have to see uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be attrition, and I think you're right. The smaller producers, the juniors, will not make it, and they may be taken over by the larger companies. Yeah, that's that's interesting about about core's costs. Yeah, I don't think that the capital is available from the majority companies, even larger companies. There's not a lot of capital available because the the penalty rates for debt and equity at these levels, especially because we've been in a cyclical bear market since 2011. Uh, switching gears here, let's let's talk about the oil market. Um, you know, we we have an, another situation similar to gold or silver, where a lot of these oil producers, shale oil guys. They're producing now, if, if they hadn't hedged their uh, shale oil production at a much higher price, you know, 18 months ago or two years ago, and locked in, you know, $90, $92 a barrel oil production, they they would probably be going bankrupt. Um, so do, do you think the, the oil market, uh, what we have now for U.S. oil production, is sustainable with this shale oil boom? No. And one of the uh, – I don't. Um, I, think, I think the U.S. Uh, – energy industry, especially the shale, oil, and gas industry, is in severe trouble. And I mentioned before, Art Berman is one of the top energy analysts that I follow. He's got a great website called artberman.com. And uh, he's done some great uh, hour and a half uh, presentations in Houston. Um, and uh, he stated that the shale, U.S. shale gas industry is a commercial failure. And it, it, we need, he believes we need seven to eight uh, dollars for MMBTU for natural gas for it to break even. And it's in the $2 now. And he just put up a chart, a table here for the oil, um, for the shale oil players. And uh, if we look at the total debt for the, these shale oil players that he's put in this table, uh, they had $83 billion in 2013. Now it's $90 billion. Their free cash flow 
which is taking the operating cash and minus thing out, taking out the, uh, the capital expenditures, was negative 5.5 billion, and it's doubled. It's now negative 10.4 billion. So even with the hedges, these these shale oil companies are hurting, and uh, because of the price of oil has fallen so much, especially West Texas. We have to remember that a lot of that oil in the back end is is a uh, transported by truck so it's very expensive or by rail so they're not getting fifty dollars if the current price of uh, west texas i think it's 54 now 53 uh, the shale players are getting like thirty dollars thirty five dollars so they're getting much less um he says that we'll probably see 500 to 600 thousand barrel a day drop off of shale oil by june and now The EIA, which is the U.S. Energy Information Agency, they still show our production increasing here in the U.S. I think their last uh, report said we are at 9.4 million barrels a day and growing. uh, But according to the North Dakota Department of Resources, they put out their own state data for the back end. Uh, They said that uh, the back end peaked in December of 2014 at 1.16 million barrels a day. And it's now down in February, and they just released their results for February. It's now down to 1.1. Well, if you look at the EIA's forecast, uh, they show February at 1.3. So there's a there's a two almost a 200,000 barrel difference for the EIA, which is a estimation of production, compared to what the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources has put out. So if we include Texas, Texas is probably in the same predicament. Uh, I think production is already declining, and I think Art Berman will be right. We're going to see a half a million barrels of more taken off of the shale oil industry. So uh, let me say one more thing. You need a lot of drilling rigs to produce shale oil. It's a, it has between a, 15, a 40% and 50% annual decline rate. So you have to add, and I think in the back end, you have to drill 1,200 to 1,300 wells a year just to keep production flat. Well, the drilling rigs last year at this time were 1,570 1,517 oil drilling rigs. Uh, Last week, they're down to 760. And Texas took the biggest beat. They're down 457 oil uh, drilling rigs. And North Dakota is down 90. So I think we're going to see a real surprise here by the summer. Um, And people who think this boom, this shale oil boom is going to continue, I think we're going to see a rude awakening uh, by the summer of this year. Yeah, I think that I follow a lot of other oil research work. I think we've discussed this in emails. I cover the oil market a lot, too. I have good a couple of good contacts down in Houston, Texas, and they expect uh, the shale oil boom, the production to start declining, not necessarily by June, but by um, either the uh, Q3 of 2015 or by the end of the year. Um, because uh, th- these these rigs, I mean, they're they're more efficient. There's multi-pad drilling, but it doesn't solve the problem of the depletion rates in the wells. So they, they can make the rigs more efficient, but the wells they cannot make more efficient. So if they're producing two or 3,000 barrels a day initially of oil and natural gas as a byproduct, I mean, those depletion rates are 50, 60, 70 percent in the first year. By year three, I think, uh, Steve, aren't they like there's a 90 percent total decline rate from that initial uh, production rate in, in the wells? So maybe those oil wells um, – that were drilled three, four years ago, they're producing only 100 or 200 barrels per day when they were initially producing, you know, two or 3,000 barrels per day. That's correct. Uh, I don't have the chart in front of me, but Rune Lickvern, he's uh, a consultant in Norway. He's done some great work on the on the back end. And he's got this chart that for, you know, I think the back end started about 2007, 2008. And he takes each year and shows you the, the change and the, the decline rate. And then he adds the next year, 2009, 10, 11, and up to 14. Well, when he adds 2014 color to the chart, to see that decline, half of all the production in 2014, half of the production, which was 1.1, 1.2 million barrels in North Dakota, came in, in 2014. And so... And if you look at 2008 and 9, the decline rates are more subtle. 
and but as we look at 2014, they're like a it's they're steep. Well, uh, David Hughes, who's uh, uh, an energy analyst who uh, worked for in Canada, he did a, a drilling deeper. It's a large 100 page, maybe 150 page uh, report on the shale plays, all of them, the natural gas and oil. And he, he sees that high oil prices that the back end would peak this year and the Eagle Ford next year. And that's at a hundred and a hundred and ten dollars a barrel. So at four at forty or fifty they're getting now, um, I think that will change. So once we hit peak in 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 the shale oil industry and we start seeing these declines, even if the price of oil went back up I don't know if the, the, the industry is going to be able to get the financing that it did before to continue this this drilling mill uh, to bring on more production. If they don't continue bringing on more production, we're going to see higher declines. And we have to remember they went after the sweet spots first. They're going to start moving out to the less productive wells, which will decline even faster. So uh, I don't know. I, I think – I think by 2020, we'll know, uh, we'll know well enough that the, the, the shale oil boom is, is, is done and over. Well, the, the funny thing about this, Steve, is uh, most of the stuff I hear from CNBC and Bloomberg, you know, talking about how there's this oil supply glut, you know, it's only looking at the United States. So, yes, the gas prices are really cheap here in the United States because of shale oil. Yes, we are producing a lot more oil. We're still importing a lot of oil, too, by the way. But um, in, in terms of the globe, I mean, um, you know, this this shale oil boom, there's not a lot of economic shale oil deposits in other areas of the world. The U.S. has a lot of major advantages to why it's producing uh, at a much lower cost of shale oil compared to the rest of the world. Also, the cheap debt here in the U.S. So the, the, these U.S. shale oil producers, they were given a lot of cheap debt. And normally in the oil industry, you're not supposed to drill on debt, but these guys did. And, you know, they, they thought they were okay by hedging and they thought the oil price would stay above 70 or it would stay between 70, you know, and a hundred dollars a barrel and they'd be fine. And we're not, we're not seeing that. So, um, you know, we're seeing enormous decline rates, I think of four to 5% globally for the majority of conventional oil production and the shale oil production, uh, just from the United States is not really offsetting it globally. So long-term there's going to be a large price to pay in, in the oil market, for all these capex cuts, like you said, I think we've gone from um, over eight hundred billion dollars worth of committed capex project spending. I think we've been cut, you know, twenty thirty percent right off the top. There, there's going to be long term ramifications for that. Why we're not spending money on research and development to find more oil? Well, uh, Steve Coppitz did a, gr a great presentation called the supply constraint model. Um, most most of the energy companies and analysts that go by the demand model, demand the demand model, and uh, the I believe uh, from what I've read, the world can't afford 120 oil. We we could peak, we can hit it like we peaked or we can hit a, a spike there, but we can't afford 120 oil. The the uh, the middle middle class, the uh, the world in general can't afford 120 oil. Uh, we see that's the new price for uh, the, the majors. They need 120 to bring on new projects. And uh, they they found out that by the end of 2013 that the sharehold, their shareholders said, listen, you're spending all this money all these last few years on capital and exploration, but you're not making the profits like you used to. So stop doing that because we, we want to see profits. So they cut back severely. Uh, starting at the end of 2013, and this is when Brent was still 110. Uh, what happens now at, at uh, 55? So the only, and this is one more thing I'll add to that. I do not believe shale oil would have been as, as successful in the United States if it wasn't for the U.S. Fed and central banks propping up the whole system after 2008. By them propping up the system with trillions of, of dollars in liquidity and then forcing the interest rate to zero, it allowed us to afford this expensive oil, which we could drill because you need expensive price, you need high prices to drill, you need $100 to drill shale oil. And you also, a low interest rate allowed uh, junk bond or a high 6 8% returns on investing in the shale oil industry and gas industry. So, I don't believe the world can afford expensive oil. 
So what happens in the future? I think uh, uh, we are going to see a, a peak and decline of unconventional. Russia has a, a, a big shale oil field that they're trying to uh, – they're doing expiration on right now, and they may bring on some of that, and China has some. But you're right. The rest of the world – uh, doesn't have the same economics, the same infrastructure, and I believe a lot of the uh, people, citizens in other countries, do not own the mineral rights of their properties. So it's, it, they don't want all these fleets of trucks running up and down the road, drilling these wells all over the place, making a mess, and not be, not being uh, able to profit from that. And so uh, Chevron, they just they just up and left Europe. Their last project, they were drilling uh, for shale exploration in, in Poland. They, they totally left um, Europe. So uh, it looks like you're right. I don't believe the shale uh, model will work in many other places. Uh, Russia and China are the wild card, but guess what? That's not all oil. Yeah, and de definitely not at these prices, Steve. I mean, maybe if we go to 110, 120 a barrel, and we stay there for a while, maybe the, um, the ec project economics of this shale oil um, in Argentina or China or Poland, uh, or I think they just found a lot of it actually like in, I know they found it in France, but uh, Paris said they won't uh, allow the drilling underneath there. And I know they just found a, a big discovery, I think, in London, uh, not too far outside London. So they are finding a lot of shale, but, you know, there's immense challenges, a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, compared to the United States, the U.S. just has major advantages for developing it, where they could uh, they had the artificially suppressed debt, and we had the the uh, oil technology uh, technological advantages and uh, and other stuff. Um, but the, the majority of oil production now, Steve, um, at least according to my research, you know whether it's deep water or um, or oil sands or even a lot of the conventional oil production now, a lot of it's not economic at these prices anymore. So um, we're we're in a clearly unsustainable oil price environment where, you know, we have the people on Wall Street who look at the oil chart and saying, oh, you know, it's going to 20 or $10 a barrel or something. And, you know, you, if the oil price does go to $20 a barrel or below or stays there for a while, I mean, it's going to put um, a lot of these oil companies that have a lot of debt, it's going to put them in a lot of financial trouble, potential bankruptcies. It could potentially, you know, topple governments like Venezuela, Nigeria, um, you know, even the Saudis who claim to be able to produce at nine or ten dollars a barrel, they even have depletion problems. They brought on a lot of higher cost production in the last decade or two, and their costs have gone up. I think their costs have doubled in the last 12, 15 years. So, um, you know, it, it, I don't see a low oil price sustainable um, in, in any environment just because of the supply constraints that you mentioned. Yes. And uh we are in a situation now where uh, I think this, the the energy this, the energy sector could it could uh, it could you know unravel quickly um, and kind of like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Uh, it, it's like you 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 add debt and you you hold things off for so long, and then when the price falls, it's like look at Bernie Madoff. Uh, he was able to hold you know hold together that Ponzi scheme for years, and it wasn't until the the broader stock markets crashed in 2008 and 9, it, you know it it it. Uh, it unraveled his whole system based on leverage. Well, I think the same thing is going to happen now. We're going to see uh, – I think we're going to see serious bankruptcies in the in the energy sector here, especially the U.S. oil uh, – shale oil gas companies, uh, because, you know, the only way you can pay back debt is by making profits. Well, I've seen the, these uh, tables that they're, they're not making any profits. Very few are, maybe one or two or three, but – out of the fifteen twenty, so that's not sustainable. And what does that what does that do? This is how I relate it. What does the energy do to the paper markets? Because paper markets, whether you're trading treasuries or whether you're trading stocks or bonds, it's all based upon net present value. It's like a time machine. You take future valuations, future earnings, and you give it a price today. Well, the EIA and the IEA, which is the International Energy Agency, they have rosy forecasts of continuing global oil production increases for the next 20, 30 years. Well, that's not reality. Those are political forecasts because if we knew that peak oil was here 
uh, within this year or so and, and within the next 10 years, it will be down considerably. Well, what does that do to all the net present value of all these trillions of tens and hundreds of trillions of dollars of paper assets that we trade? It destroys them. So that's one of the fundamental reasons why I believe gold and silver, physical, especially physical gold and silver, will become some of the best stores of value because each coin of gold and silver contains stored economic energy or energy value. All the paper assets, whether they're treasuries, whether they're retirement accounts, whether they're stocks, they are energy IOUs. Uh, for those to be paid off or to be paid back, you need to burn energy in the future, create, create economic activity, and you can't have a stable. You have to have a growing. Uh, and so if it starts to decline, it puts severe stress on that highly leveraged fiat debt-based derivative system. And uh, I think once it starts to unravel, Jason, um, I, I believe there will be a lot of quite surprised people. They, they wouldn't see this coming like they didn't see 1929 coming, uh, the, the uh, crash of the stock market in 29. Uh, I don't think they'll see this coming. It'll be a, it'll be a shock. Yeah, and that's why gold or silver are good forms of money. That's why they store value so well and store purchasing power is because they're hard to produce. They're not easy for the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank or the People's Bank of China to just go on their computer and, you know, hit three keys and uh, automatically, you know, a billion or a trillion dollars are created. That's why, um, you know, they put constraints on the creation of easy money and easy credit and, you know, um, the, this Keynesian view that, we should just flood the markets with um, easy money and easy credit. So I, I think it's a good point there that um, that metal does store uh, economic value and economic energy very well. But the, these oil companies, besides just earning a profit, Steve, I mean, they're they're going to be able to sell some shares still, I guess, to some people to pay off some debt, maybe, you know, a debt for equity swap. But, you know, if they dilute their shareholders too much, you know, the management teams will get fired, the board of directors will get replaced. So they're only going to be able to do that as a temporary stopgap, maybe to buy a little bit of time. I guess, obviously, they're hoping and praying that the oil price is going to go back up and uh, soon and bail them out. Well, you know, and it's, it's how we look at the situation. Um, as we discussed before we started the interview, uh, Certain entities, uh, maybe hedge funds, maybe large investors, uh, uh, even the federal government, uh, central banks, they look, they are looking at a day to day, week to week, uh, quarter to quarter, you know, month to month, quarter to quarter. They, it's like we, they want to get past the next day, the next week, the next month. Well, you know, we're humans. We're human beings. We live 70, 80, 90 years if you take care of yourself. So, you know, a week, a month, a quarter, that's nothing. Uh, so I tend to look at these longer trends. Now, uh, some people who follow my work say, well, why can't uh, the price of gold and silver be manipulated if it has been for the last um, 10 years? Because in 1980, we had a peak of silver and gold prices, and then for 25 years, they just languished nowhere. And so certain investors, a lot of investors believe that that might happen again. Well, I would agree. It could the price of the metals could languish for years if it wasn't for the falling energy return on invested of oil and peak oil. Those two things are going to destroy the highly leveraged paper financial system that this world is based upon. I mean, it's, it's basically Bernie Madoff, you know, gone, gone viral. And so uh, while the energy companies mining companies and even all the crazy broader stocks and the, and the Dow Jones and S&P will continue business as usual for another week, another month, another quarter, another year. This, this is not something that's going to last for another five, 10 years. I, I truly believe by 2020, we are going to see a much different system. And uh, I'm looking at one chart by Jean Lahira, and uh, he shows that U.S. oil production will be down to below 1 million barrels a day by 2040, about 2.5 million barrels a day by 2030. We're, that's a 75% decline from where it is today. And the rest of the world is going to, going to be experiencing declines as well. So how do you run Dallas, Chicago, uh, L.A., or Manhattan? 
on 50 or 75 percent less energy and then what does that do to the price of real estate what does that do to the economic situation so of course there's a lot of other things we could talk about you know renewables but they're not going to scale so these are the factors that i believe the short-term investors are totally missing and uh, while they're not right here in front of us they will be here within five ten years and maybe we may start seeing them in the next year or two. The, the ramifications, we may start feeling them um, in, in share prices in uh, in the next few years. There's Steve, there's just a massive amount of myopia from the economic and political elites in power, you know, the people on Wall Street, the hedge fund managers, uh, the politicians, the central planners, the, the central bankers, the bureaucrats, the people running these government agencies. I mean, most of them don't think more than a year or two out. Um, some of them, you know, if they're on Wall Street, you know, they don't even think a couple weeks or a month out. They consider long term maybe a year. So when they're looking at five or 10 years out, you know, that's way beyond their time frame. They don't uh, most of them don't even care what happens five or 10 years out. But yeah, that that's a very interesting thing you brought up here. Um, I think there's going to be a good amount of natural gas available, but I think you said we need a much higher price. But the U.S. does have a lot of natural gas unless we start exporting massive amounts of it. Um, there's going to be a good amount of natural gas for the U.S. to use maybe as some type of transition to a more sustainable economy. But um, my final question, and I had a listener comment on a recent video. Um, he seems very smart. He's He's an Austrian school economist. He was actually questioning – the validity of energy return on energy invested. So how would you respond to critics who say that energy return on energy invested doesn't matter and that only economic costs matter? So if, you know, an oil deposit is a lot more money than, say, a subsidized solar plant or something, how would you respond to uh, to say that, you know, that this uh, this uh, solar plant, which is heavily subsidized, even though the panels are falling, is um, not really as good as the economics look? All right, before I get into that, um, Art Berman looked at the official reserves of oil, shale oil, and shale gas, and he states we've got eight years' worth of shale gas at current consumption rates. Eight years, that's it. That, that's it. That's, that's what, according to the official EIA reserves of recoverable, technically recoverable, economically recoverable shale gas, eight years. And uh, shale gas is now uh, a larger percentage of the conventional. So if you add conventional, it's going to be more than that. But the, you know, Jason, this isn't this isn't decades of shale gas. We've got eight years of shale gas uh, at current consumption rates. And he said, shale oil, we've got three years at total current consumption rates of oil, which is uh, 19 million barrels a day. But this is not this is nothing we're going to transition on. Uh, we're burning this stuff uh, like crazy. However, the subject of the energy return on invested, and I, I have read a little bit about the Austrian school kind of uh, uh, looking at this, debating this, saying it's not a problem because you know mankind will always be able to. Uh, we're smart, you know. We we'll just we'll just uh, we'll invent just, something new, right? Correct. More efficient. Well, you see, the problem is technology. People say we'll just use technology. Well, technology cost money and money is energy money is energy so if we're using more technology we're using more energy to get the energy so it continues to it continues to devour that energy return on invested and uh, like I said before the US we were finding oil fields in the 1900s they were hundreds to thousands energy return on invested well we have a trillion barrels of resources of oil shale in the West. So people say, well, there you go. Uh, we've got a trillion barrels there. We've got so much oil, we don't have to worry about it. Well, that's less than two to one uh, energy return on invested. Well, here's the thing that the, the Austrians, the Austrian School of Economics failed to understand. Charles Hall, who was one of the leading minds on the, the study of the EROI, says that our society needs about a 10, probably a 12 to 1 energy return on invested to sustain our lifestyle. Well, back in EROI of 5 to 1, Eagle Ford at 5 to 1, that doesn't do it. Tar sands at 4 to 1 doesn't do it. 
why would we go after oil, crappy oil shale at two to one? So, you see, unless you look at these things in a overall perspective, a bird's eye view, uh, Rome fell. The Roman Empire fell not because of uh, they were drinking lead, they had used lead, or their their uh, their morals declined, or uh, whatever they want to attribute to the fall of Rome. Joseph Tainer said it: the Roman Empire fell because its energy return on invested of its system declined. And uh, and that's that's the important key to understand. Uh, the, their human farming is about five to one energy return on invested. So that was their sustaining number, five to one. But you cannot hold a huge uh, area of land with uh, with forces, with the legions, with forts, and all this on five to one. You need a much higher. And early on, the Romans, they used their legions. They would conquer new lands. They would gain access to wealth, uh, mines, silver, gold mines. So they were getting this high energy return on invested from the wealth that they were they were acquiring early on. But then as the empire grew so large, just like the U.S., United States, they had to maintain it, and they could no longer they could no longer find uh, places to to occupy and take over to gain this high energy return on invested. So they had to sustain themselves on that low five to one farming and it didn't work. Well, if we understand our history, the, uh, the Eastern Roman empire survived a thousand years. They didn't debase their currency, the gold Byzantine coin, and they had mostly agrarian uh, lifestyle, which was five to one. So they lasted a thousand years because they had a much lower sustainable uh, EROI in, uh, system, empire, where the Western uh, Empire, Roman Empire collapsed. And the United States is, is going right down the same trend as the Roman Empire. We need a 12 to one, and we're trying to we're trying to supplement it with crappy five to one back in an Eagle Ford. And uh, so that's the that's the reason why I differ or disagree with the, the Austrian school of economics. Uh, we uh, we've run we've run, actually run out of the clock. We don't know it yet, but we've run the clock out, Jason. And I think uh, I think we'll start to see more stress here in the next few years. And and so uh, it'll be interesting going forward. Well, one thing I would add. Um, I, I do like the Austrian School of Economics, and I'm not sure if they have a particular view on peak oil or not. I'm just saying that the person who brought it up, he he's smart. I normally speak with him, but um, I disagree with him on this issue, you know, about how energy return on energy invested doesn't really matter, um, and energy density doesn't really matter. Um, one other thing I can add, though, is, you know, there's a lot of technology people, Silicon Valley people, environmentalists. Uh, Elon Musk is leading the charge on this. You know, he thinks that we're going to be able to, everyone's going to be able to switch to electric cars with supercharger stations and solar panels on their houses or maybe solar powered cars with new batteries and things like that. But um, a lot of these, a lot of these solar panels, you know, they're reliant on rare earth metals, which are, um, the China's destroyed their environment to mine at a very low cost. They're not cheap and easy to mine these things. So anything that has to be mined, Steve, um, you know, there's increasing amounts of energy that needs to be used to mine the stuff. So if we're using silver in solar panels or we're using uh, silver in a new type of battery or we're, we're switching to hybrid electric cars, which use a good amount of either silver or rare earth metals or things like that, uh, these things need to be mined in increased amounts. And the more we mine, you know, the more energy we use. So it's kind of a – I think most of the people – who um, are environmentalists, I don't think they fully understand the, the full supply chain side of how, the mining cycle there and how much uh, extra energy is going to be needed then to still produce their metals for their uh, alternative energy um, future. I agree. Let me, take, let me say two things. Richard Heinberg, I, he's a really uh, a good writer and speaker, and he talks about um, the renewables and green energy. And, and his basic assumption, and I agree with him, is that Renewables just won't scale, and renewables uh, are are actually uh, fossil fuel derivatives. You need fossil fuels to to produce those, so they, they just won't scale. And that that's the subject of a whole interview. They're not going to be able to scale those to the to the amount we need. Um, and the second thing, God, I lost my train of thought. Uh, let me think. 
Richard Richard Heinberg. Um, Richard Heinberg, why the renewables won't scale? Yeah. Um, gosh, I had that second. Well, I had that second idea in my mind, and I thought hopefully. Well, it we we've been talking for about fifty five <laughs> minutes, so um, it's 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 been a very interesting discussion, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, probably one of your longer interviews. Not sure how long you do these interviews for, but I I really enjoyed this interview so far. I think we can talk for a lot longer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I agree. You know, I think the the the, the problem with uh, the prop. Gosh, I had that. I had it all worked up in my head what I was going to tell you because it, it's really important. But um, uh, yeah, the the renewables won't scale. And uh, well, I guess you can you can edit this out, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I just want to thank you again for your time, Steve. We'll, we'll talk more about the renewables in the next interview um, next time we have you on. I really enjoyed this discussion, and I think you provided our, our listeners for a, a really good arguments about why this low oil price is not sustainable and um, you know, the shale oil industry is not economic. It uh, seems like an illusion, I guess. And um, you know, the gold or silver miners, um, they're, they're in a lot of trouble here if the metals price doesn't start to rise. Yeah, I I agree, and uh, you know, and this is the difference between what I what what I try to do on my site and what uh, I see other precious metal analysts. We, you know, we've been seeing a lot of hype that we're going to see the uh, big increase or the, the, in the prices or default of the comex, and of course, those things probably will happen in the future. You, you just don't know when. So, to me, the best thing to focus on is the energy, because the energy the energy situation will force will force the hand of everything else. Uh, it it will force the comex default uh, in one way or another, or in one, you know, sooner or later. So I, I think if we focus on the fundamentals rather than the, the next week or next month, that's the reason you invest in the precious metals. It's like a retirement account. It's a real retirement account. The, the only difference is when you invest and acquire gold and silver, physical gold and silver, you have something that you can cash in and trade for economic energy or economic value, uh, whereas that retirement account, is not a store of value. It's it's a it's a uh, it's an energy IOU. It's something that has to be paid back. So uh, I really think that the, the precious metals probably will be the best things to invest in, in going forward. Yeah, I think they're some of the most in, undervalued assets because it seems like everything else, Steve, whether it's the stock market, uh, the general stock market, or the bond market, or real estate markets, or diamonds, or um or artwork or antiques or rare collectibles, you know, these types of things, they're they're all in enormous asset price bubbles. They just keep going the price of these things just keeps seem to go up and up and up, you know, every couple of months. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, lastly, I think the important the important takeaway here is there's very little gold and silver. And as I said before, the uh, gold physical gold and silver are not only competing with the US dollar and other fiat currencies as well as all the treasuries and bonds in the world, they're competing with the the retirement accounts, which is, uh, I think the global conventional assets now, Jason, are over $105 trillion. And that's retirement, that's insurance funds, mutual funds. So all these investors are expecting to get that money that they've invested, that digit that's in an account. They expect to get that back. Well, uh, you know, you need growing energy supply to to pay back those assets, those paper IOUs, whereas gold and silver do not have that problem because the, it's already stored in the physical coins. So I think there will be, uh, I think we will see a huge move into uh, the physical metals uh, once the world realizes that they've invested in the wrong asset. Well, we're already starting to see that move, Steve. Um, a lot of metals transferring from west to east. The demand for the actual metal, not paper gold or pa paper gold or paper silver, the demand is very strong coming out of India and China, Asia, Middle East, etc. But the paper price is is uh, not reflecting, um, you know, any fundamentals of supply and demand. Yeah, and I I've, I've spoke about the two ways to value silver, and the one way that we're seeing right now, the current way, is uh, it's it's a supply chain based on uh, cost and supply and demand. It's not how what it's not the value of silver. It's not a store of value that determines its price or value. It's how much is consumed. 
either through industrial uh, or investment demand. So if we consume more, uh, supposedly the price goes up. And if there is a surplus, then the price falls. So that's that's the, the present mechanism for pricing silver and gold. It's almost like a commodity. But their, their, real, value, their real, real value, I believe, is their store of value. And most investors don't know their store of value because they're, they're blindly invested in paper assets where they think they have a store of value. So uh, once the realization hits, Jason, I think we will see the prices and the values of these metals increase uh, substantially, whereas paper assets will decline. Yeah, I, I agree. The cyclical, this artificial paper manipulated uh, cyclical bear market that's lasted for three years is going to have to end in in the near future, or we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies from the miners, and we're going to see enormous supply shocks from the copper byproduct of gold and silver coming offline and the primary gold or silver miners shutting down mines or going bankrupt. I just want to thank you again for your time, Steve. I really enjoyed this hour-long discussion. I could obviously speak to you a lot longer than this, but um, I think we should cut things off here around an hour. Uh, please tell our listeners uh, more about your website, SRS Rocco Report. Hi, okay. It's uh, At the SRS Rocco Report, I put out uh, two to three articles a week, and I, I focus on the the silver mining cost and as well as energy, energy return on invested, and as well as the gold and silver market. I look at the investment, uh, I look at trends that change in the, in the precious metal industry. And uh, I, I welcome anybody to come over and take a look. And in the future, I'm working on three reports. Uh, I think these reports, this one report I'm working on totally changes how investors look at silver. Uh, there's information in that report I don't think anybody or very few have seen in the precious metal industry. It, when I came across this research, I was totally uh, shocked. Uh, and so uh, I'll be putting out these reports. Hopefully one will be coming out next, uh, next month and they'll be following uh, a month after. Great. Well, um, I, I think our listeners will find that very interesting. Your articles on on how much it costs, you know, to replace these uh, these giant earth mover caterpillar uh, earth mover truck tires, and how like much more diesel usage the uh, mining industry, uh, gold mining industry is using over the last 12 years. You know, even though the diesel price may be down, the total amount of diesel usage has massively increased in the last 12 years, and grades and things like that. I just don't see that from most gold or silver mining analysts. So I think you, I just want to give you a uh, uh, props for doing a, a great exemplary job here. Uh, on your research. Yeah, thanks for the interview. And uh, what I think was interesting, some of these huge haul trucks are like $5 million. That's the price tag. So that's a lot of money. And they lost, I think they last like five or six years and then they, they get new ones. They actually spend more money on tires for that truck over that six year period than they spend on the truck itself. Think about that. that that's, that's, that's I mean, in they, they run things. They run those trucks like twenty four seven, and they just wear up those tires. And some of those tires are like, I think twelve feet tall. So, and it's all oil that goes into producing those tires. So it, it is a major cost now to produce gold. It, it's very high. Yeah, that's that's just insane that they spend. Uh, you kind of broke up there for a little bit, so I'll just give our listeners a quick summary before I let you go. That's just insane that these mining companies now they spend more money in a six-year period for replacing truck tires than they do on the initial uh, cost of the five million dollar Caterpillar uh, earth mover truck. Uh, but I think that shows how you know it's it's really very difficult now for a lot of these mining companies at the mine to come up with new ways to cut costs uh, going forward. You know they can cut they've cut costs a lot in the last two years. But I think they've cut all the easy costs they can cut, and they've just they're running out of ways that they can cut costs. There's just geological challenges now to cutting costs without drastically uh, reducing the supply or shutting down their mines. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a limit to how much that they can reduce costs, and I think costs are going to continue to increase. Uh, that's going to be the, the the challenge for the industry going forward. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for your time, Steve. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thanks, Jason. It was a great interview.